Last week, if you remember, I started talking about the, um, the Word of God, and in the first verse, uh, the first verse of our, of our passage for Pergamum, verse 12 of chapter 2, he says, Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum, thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. And the uniqueness to each church, the unique message, he gives a different introduction to each and different kinds of things at the end. But that double-edged sword, verse 12, and also in 16, is the word of God. It's the word coming out of the mouth of Christ. And so we started to delve into that because... That's his theme to them. And we said a lot of times we think of the, the sword, the word of God in Revelation, in Revelation 19 in different places. It's really horrific. And it is judgment and it is devastation is coming. But it's coming upon evil. And it's about the love of God for his bride and the righteousness of God. So what's going on is, I said, also the double-edged sword, it, it simultaneously does two things. I, there may be destruction, and I'm going to get into this and explain, but it also delivers. That's our review. It is deliverance. It is, it is a sword of victory, a sword of deliverance. Now let me go back over into Hebrews for a moment. And I, that's where I ended last week, and I want to start up again there. Uh, I, I started in Hebrews 4, verse 12. And it goes like this. For the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able, here's the key, to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And then you remember last week how I ended, no creature is hidden from the eyes of him. We are exposed and naked before him to whom we must give an account. We need the church to hear that part, that we are, gonna, we are exposed before him. And then I said, boy, that sounds scary. That just sounds terrible. But the next part really excited me, and I'm coming back to that. So we're going to give an account to him. And that sounds like, oh no, man, I'm going before the judge. But would you just listen to this for a moment? Therefore, verse 14, therefore, I said, is always a transitional word, actually sometimes translated but. So you're going to be before God, giving an account before him. But, therefore, since you have a high, great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Now I'm going to keep moving. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us approach the throne of grace, listen to this verse, with boldness, so that we can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So, let me, let me just say this. How common it is, they go, well, you know, yeah, but Jesus, because when I say he was tempted, listen to this, in every way that you are. Yeah, you know, but uh, Jesus, you know, he, he didn't sin. Well, yeah, it says that. But, well, I'm not Jesus. Now that becomes our truth. I'm not Jesus. That's the big thing we become. Yet you're told in the scripture over and over you are to be the reproduction of his life. He wants to do that in you. But it's easy to say, I'm not Jesus so. And he hasn't gone through some of the things I have. Yet this says the opposite. Let me fact, think about this. And then let's really correct our thinking. Not only has he been tempted in every way you are yet had victory. Amen. Yet had victory. He had a lot worse put on him than you did. Yeah. We well, say he didn't he didn't he didn't go through what I yes he did. But he did more. He was rejected. He was beat. You didn't 
didn't go through the cross. You didn't carry everybody else's stuff. He had far more laid on him than you'll ever get laid on you. And yes, yet without sin. Well, but he's Jesus. That's the good news. Because Jesus saves and he... Listen, here's, here's one of my favorite parts of this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Here it is. You go, I'm going to stand open before God. Yes. And he knows every weakness in you. He knows every strength, every weakness, every hurt, every pain, every situation. He knows. And you know what the word in the, to sympathize? It is actually to feel, in the Greek, to feel like another. To feel like another feels. It is even beyond empathy. It's so strong. To feel, really feel what someone, get this straight, to feel. It's not like I feel for you. I can feel for people. I'm, I might even have had the same situation as you. Or maybe you had the loss of a parent. And I go, hey man, I hear you. I've had that too. But that's kind of feeling for you. I might even be feeling kind of with your circumstance. But there's only one who can actually feel you. Yeah. He feels you. Because yeah. he goes right into the heart. Yeah. He goes into the mind. You see what it said? That double-edged sword? It's not torture. He goes in and he discerns what's going on. And you say, people just don't know. And, they, and it's so true. People just don't understand how I feel when I'm alone or at certain times. He does. Amen. He knows. And you can cry out to him at any time. And, and so you're going to be open to him. But could you just take the scripture and just put a little different light on it? Open like, he wants to smash me. I'm exposed. No, he wants to save you. And the only way that you can get really saved, and here's part of the problem with the church today, the reason we don't have more people saved is they have not been exposed to their sin. That's right. If you don't know your sin, if you haven't had all of that exposed, that's what a loving God has done through Jesus. He wants to expose so he can save. You would get that fully if you were going to a doctor. In fact, let's talk about that. But I'll, I'll wrap this up. Because of that, therefore, he said, because he feels you, and he's been tempted in every way, and he's beat it, he's the one counselor that can say, I've been there, and I beat it. I might say, yeah, I've been there, and I was pretty miserable just like you. But Jesus beat it. Okay. Um, so then he says, therefore, let us approach with boldness. Well, just a few verses before, it's like, oh no, I'm exposed. He found out about me. <laughs> he knew all along. Mm -hmm. And now, instead of, he knows I'm in trouble, it's, he's saying, I see everything. Now come boldly with confidence to the throne of judgment, right? Grace. The throne of grace. You know what that is? Favor. He's saying, come to me. I'm going to expose you, but then you know what I want you to do? Once you see who you are and you see who I am, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have no fear about coming to me for mercy and favor. Woo, what a God. Isn't that something? Man. Um, all right, that's one scripture. Let me go back to, I said we'll talk about it for a moment, back to the, 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 the double-edged sword and the, the knife idea, if you will. Hmm. Let me ask this. Is it fair to call is it okay for me to call cancer evil? Yeah. Sure. Definitely. 
lot of people. You know what I see all the time? Because there's so much cancer. In but people will say, oh, I hate the cancer. And, and I hear you. I've lost a sibling to it. I hear you. I hate cancer. I've got another one that just came through a surgery. I, I hate cancer. It, it's taken lives like you can't believe. But you know, cancer is the one disease we can talk about. Don't misunderstand me. Cancer is a disease. Cancer is not sin. But we often talk about cancer because we get a better picture of this disease. Because cancer is, there can be healthy cells and there's a healthy body. And then suddenly some of these cells start getting corrupted. And they not only are corrupted in themselves, they begin to destroy healthy cells around them. Now we're going to come back to that message in a week or two. We'll still be in Pergamum, but we're going to come back about what disease is in a church body or in a life in terms of sin, okay? And that's important because in your own life, you can feel so healthy and then something is going on unseen and you don't know it. I remember Frank, and we loved Frank, and he had no idea when he went to the doctor, it was like, Frank, you're filled with cancer. Well, I didn't know that. And, and, and I'm so glad that we have a doctor that comes to us. Amen. He comes to us. He makes house calls. And he comes to us. And so, let's think about that for a moment. So the knife that can stab and kill and destroy is the knife that saves at the same time, the surgeon's knife, correct? Mm -hmm. It goes in with the knife. And I'm going to tell you something. There's no better, no better um, procedure or outcome for cancer if they can do it when it's actually surgery and not just the radiation or whatever. I mean, if cancer is there and it's serious, they always say, I think we got it all. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got it. And what they have to do now is they will go beyond the borders of the cancer. Yep. Yep. They got to make sure they got it. Because if you don't get it all out, it can come back and it can begin to affect cells. And you know what? Jesus is so much more thorough Amen. than any doctor. And he comes in and he says, let me come in. And this is going to hurt. But he says, here it is. I'm going to take the sword of my mouth. I'm going to take, by the way, the knife is the word of God. It's the word of God. You've got to be in this, folks. You've got to be in this. I, I don't care if you listen on tape or whatever, but go through the word of God if you can't read. I mean, if your eyes are failing, listen. Turn it on. But the sword out of his mouth, the surgery that's out of his mouth, that heals is his word. He comes in, and it cuts at times, and he says, we got it. And whenever something comes up again, he's a doctor that you don't have to worry if you'll just, here's why you want to expose yourself to him. Because, Lord, do a scan on me, will you? It's not fear. It's not that you go for scans to find out what's wrong. I'd rather be scanned by him than any doctor in the world. Amen. Search me, oh God. Know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Cleanse me and set me free. That's the way to beat it. Amen. Open up. Okay. The knife. Now, let, let me just make an application. See if I can find this. Well, yeah. One of the applications is this. The Bible has a word in the Old and the New Testament. And it is a word called circumcision. And it is a spiritual and physical example of what God wants to do. Now, 
God made a covenant with Abraham to set his people apart. The nation of Israel had a lot of strange rules put on it. I mean, they couldn't eat pork. But there was a lot of things they couldn't do to separate them out. Levitical law, these laws, which really means of, of cleansing to keep them from getting diseased. So he set it up for them. But circumcision was a procedure for males in which excess skin is cut away. Get the picture now. Excess skin is cut away because it would be healthier. Less chance of disease. And he wants the nation to go on. So circumcision was to cut back that which is not necessarily bad, but not necessary or may cause disease. Okay. There were, see, I want to tell you something. Whenever God has a spiritual principle for you, spiritual principle, there's a physical benefit. Always. When he sets out something that you need to do, hey, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. There's a physical benefit when you do that because you're not, you're not separated you're not compartmentalized. You don't have the body over here, the soul here, the spirit here. You're a unit. And God wants to work on the whole thing. I, I, that's pretty clear in Romans 12 when he says, I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to present, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship or reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the mind, right? Renewing of the mind. Okay. So circumcision in Deuteronomy they said moreover the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, Deuteronomy 30 verse 8 will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul so that you may live. Here's why you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength so you can live. <laughs> Circumcision of the heart so you won't be diseased. So you won't be unhealthy. What would that mean then? What are the things in my heart that surge in Jesus? out of his great love and his great feeling me would love to cut away. So that I can live. Mm. Wouldn't this mean, this is a theological term, but it gets used by Jesus, so we'll use it. And I'll explain it. Sanctification. Sanctification is separation and cleansing. Separating out that which isn't good. Separating people, but also cleansing. It's a twofold meaning. It's a word hagias. It actually is the same root as holiness. That that he actually. This is this is tough. This is tough these days when you know most churches are telling you that there, some of them are even preaching universalism and. All of that, everybody goes to heaven no matter what you do and so on and so forth. And uh, also, cheap grace. And there is no such thing as cheap grace. Grace costs God everything. Amen. But people can cheapen it. And so they, they, they just, yeah, you, you can do whatever you want. You're saved. You can do whatever you want. That's not scriptural. It's not. If you're saved, you won't, you won't be in the place of wanting to do whatever you want. It's the way it is. Because, you know why? Because it's not an outside circumcision. It's in the heart. And the law. I've got to give this one again. I've got to give this again. The law. I, I say it a lot, but it, it, it helps people. The law. When you get out of religion and into relationship. You get out of religion. And I'm not saying religion is bad if it's of an expression of Christ. But when you get out of religiosity. And into relationship, the rules are no longer on the wall, they're on the heart. Yeah. They're not on the refrigerator, they're written on the heart. 
You know what that means? <clears throat> how, do I, how do I say this? <clears throat> Hard for me at times. So take, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Take, thou shalt not steal. Take, thou shalt not kill. And you go, yeah, well, 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 most of those are okay, but how come, how come it's so negative? And actually they're split up, but nevertheless, if I can give you this picture, if you're, if you're under the law, if it's religiosity, then it's performance, an obligation. And I didn't do well enough. So good to see you. I didn't do well enough. I could do better. And it's never enough for God because it will never be enough because you can't get to Him. But He came to you. That's the beauty. See, other religions, you've got to get to him. <laughs> or you've got to turn into a dog first and then some other things, but, <laughs> but not Jesus. He comes to you. Yeah. And here's the difference between on the heart and on the wall. <clears throat> on the wall it's, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Whew, I think I missed it today. Thou shalt not kill. Hey, I man, I made it through the day on that one. <laughs> Thou shalt not commit adultery. But when it's written on the heart, it's not a prescription. It's a description. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You will. Don't worry about it. You will. You won't, you won't kill. Trust me. When it's on the heart, the love of God is in the heart. Amen. You won't steal. You couldn't if you wanted to. That's a heart change. That's circumcision of the heart. We're all of me saying, I better do it. It changes from, I don't want to go to hell, to, I want to be with Jesus. I want to go to heaven. This is not an avoidance. It's not, oh, I got to avoid. This is a magnetism. To the majesty of God. Amen. Amen. I'm Amen. so excited I'd like to listen to this again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know that I want to go here. I'm going to just go one more further. That's it. And that'll be good. I'm actually going to give another practical from Jesus of the idea of what the Word of God can do and the power of Jesus when Jesus speaks. This may seem like kind of out there a little bit, but I'm in Matthew 8, verse 28. Now, first of all, in the verses preceding, Jesus and the disciples were on a boat, and there came up a big storm. Big storm. And they are scared to death, and the disciples are yelling, We're going to die! Jesus is sleeping. <laughs> We're going to die. And you don't care. <laughs> so, they wake him up. I can just see the man Jesus. What, what, what is it? What do you want? Oh. He said to them, <laughs> they just said, We're going to die. And he goes, Why are you afraid? <laughs> It seemed like, did you not hear their last statement? Because they're going to die. Jesus, this is not the passage I was going to share. Jesus says, um, he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. And then the, the men were amazed and they said, 
what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Wow. I'll tell you what kind of man it is. It's a man who feels you. Who's a high priest who says, come boldly to me. Oh, that kind of power. I want that in my life, Jesus. I mean that with all my heart. And to know that he can say go, but uh, let's go to the real story here. I mean, the next one, the one I was picking. When he had come to the other side, to the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him as they came out of the tombs. Mark's got a little different account, but this one's fine. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. No one wanted to be near him. Suddenly they shouted, what do you have to do with us? Son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? Isn't it something that demons are... Even they know he's the Son of God. What's wrong with people today? So they go... What do you have to do with us? They're already scared. He hasn't even said anything yet. Have you come here to torment us before... The time. That's an interesting thing said right there by itself. Because I want you to know that you may be walking through hell at times, but God has a time. God has a time. And he says, before the time, and it says, a long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and then the demons are starting to bargain with Jesus. It, well, you know, if you drive us out, what we, they begged him, is, what is that? They begged him and said, would you let us go into the herd of pigs? I want you to just view that as sin. Because it is. And Jesus uses, out of the sword of his mouth, he uses one word. <laughs> go. <laughs> it's power. Go. And they came out and entered the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water, and the men who tended them fled. They went into the city and they reported everything, especially what had happened to those who were demon-possessed. And at that, the whole town went out to Jesus to praise him, right? They went out and begged him to leave their area. Okay, hold on. We're going to close. Eventually. But I like to say that to give you hope. Um, <laughs> Jesus said to the demons, go. And the men that had been possessed were sitting there in their right mind. But, destruction of the pigs. There was destruction that day. But the destruction was of the pigs. And, and you know, sometimes our life just has some pigs. They need to go. They just need to go. You know, it's like, okay, God, he's not, he's not wanting to destroy any of you here today. He loves you. Christ died for you. He watched. The gospel is phenomenally good news. There is no better news today than the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let me just say this. Things have to go. And it's not... I'm going to tell you. You would think there's something important here. At that, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they said, please go away. Because here's, here's, here's the real deal. When Jesus moves, we think, Deliverance. Wow. A, a person who was demon possessed is whole. I can't. I just, the picture is just so amazing. And sitting there in their right mind. And, and the town says, Leave, Jesus. And yes, you know, you can figure it out. That was their livelihood, pigs. And so all of their stock, their livestock 
was wiped out in one moment. Destruction. But a deliverance. And instead of them jumping up and down and going, guess what happened? It cost us. We don't want any cost. But please remember that it's the things of this world. Your, your temporary fleeting world that's like a vapor that passes away and those things that you hold on to so tightly will be gone. Things that seem so valuable. That's why the devil does a little better job than he should be doing. Because there are so many things that seem too valuable to give up, to have Jesus work in my life. You wouldn't think so. You would think, who wouldn't want to be? A lot of people. Why, in fact, do some of you remember, if you don't, I'll just tell you, the man that was healed by Jesus and, and, and the religious group got mad and said, he healed on the Sabbath. <laughs> Rules on the law. Do you remember the woman caught in adultery? Stone her. Rules on the wall. Jesus. Where'd they go, ma'am? Where are your accusers? I have none. Here's the beauty about the power of the word of Jesus. <laughs> you got no accusers anymore. Amen. You have no accusers. They're gone. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't hold on to things. Father, 